Janie Dick is from Natick, Massachusetts, and she is a poet and an educator. She's been trained in Tai Chi and mindfulness meditation and a number of other practices. And Janie heard Dr. King speak in the early 1960s. And last year, she captivated and inspired a small group of audience who attended the Hopkinton Library event in honoring Martin Luther King Jr. with her words of article that she had published in a newspaper on her observations and her own participation during the civil rights movement. And she has agreed to speak more on this with some of her writing today and will be joined by her son, Dan Sakala. So please welcome Jamie Dick. Defining moments. My life is a civil rights activist in the 1960s. I had heard and admired Dr. Martin Luther King's activities in the early 1960s, before he was well known. When I heard that he was speaking at the Chicago Sunday Evening Club, I knew that I must go. A one-hour commuter train trip from my suburb on a very dark and very snowstormy night. None of my friends opted to go with me, small wonder. Oh, so worth it. He was indeed a strong, kind, dedicated person, making a difference. I needed to be a part of this. I became a member of my local Park Forest, Illinois, Chicago suburb, Unitarian Church Social Action Committee. We were quite active, mostly studying the interracial, ch interracial challenges that we felt were ahead and determining how we could best fit in, use our time and talents for what we considered to be a better world. The activity I remember most clearly was restaurant testing. This is an obvious activity it seems all too simple, but it was often challenging. We were usually not welcome and frequently asked to leave. This was a good starting activity for most of us, barely believable for the white participants. Home opportunities made equal. I became active in this group, a Quaker group, we brought together buyer and seller. Home members would be told when a prospective buyer was interested and unable to look at a park forest home. This was often not possible. So home would look for a similar home, occupied by a person usually not interested in selling, but interested in the home plan showing his house so that the buyer would be able to proceed. Many interesting stories evolved. My village, not surprisingly, was very fair on the integration issue. Before a move-in, the Human Relations Commission visited each home near the prospective move-in, stating that the village was not taking a position on the issue, but would not tolerate any negative activity. I heard of only one incident. A man painted his fence next to the prospective black family's home. His side white, the opposite side black. He received a visit and a warning from members of the Human Relations Commission and they repainted the house, the fence. I wrote this in December 1962. Hurting man. Hurting man. Hurting man painting fences. Hurting man. You must have fears inside covered up with hate. Look at your fears, hurting man. Look at them. And if you still must hate for a while while you are looking, 
Hate the thing inside that makes you hate. Hate fear. Hate hate. But don't hate man. Don't hate man hurting man. And please, please don't paint the fence black. Please don't paint it black for you, for me, for a man. Hurting man, I have hurt too. I know how it feels to hurt, I understand. I hold out my hand to you, hurting man. Put down the paintbrush, put it down and take my hand. NAACP. My Unitarian minister was active in the closest chapter. I went with him to a meeting. He had told me that we would probably be the only whites there. My first experience. He was correct. So interesting. The next meeting, my friend was out of town. I thought about this and decided to go by myself. It was an unusual experience. The meeting was in the basement of the Chicago Heights, Illinois Community Center. I entered the room and sat down next to the window in the first row. There were two empty chairs next to me. Men were soon carrying additional chairs and the chairs next to me remained empty the entire time quite an experience. This has a happy ending. I was accepted, even became program chairperson, and continued to work and learn. I attended several NAACP conferences, some overnighters, in other Illinois cities with my black friends. One memorable night, after an interesting closing banquet, we got in my, into my friend's car and drove and drove and drove around the city, seemingly going nowhere. I finally asked what they usually did at the closing of the conference. One of the three confessed that they usually went to the local American Legion. They obviously were not comfortable going to their segregated black American Legion with me. Hmm. Yet another experience. Chicago Freedom Movement. In, the, in late 1965, Dr. King brought his crusade for civil rights to Chicago. He came at the invitation of the Chicago Freedom Movement, a coalition of 44 civil rights organizations working to end the slums and improve living conditions for blacks in the city. The campaign offered Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, an opportunity to move the civil rights struggle into a new phase, one that addressed entrenched racial discrimination in urban cities, which kept blacks locked in ghettos, overcrowded schools, and low-paying jobs. Westside Christian Parish in Chicago was one of the headquarters for the campaign. Two of the park, my park forest friends and I volunteered here often. We were suburban housewives. Our children were in school all day, so we could drive the 30 plus miles when possible, and we loved it. We worked as needed, usually boring office work typing, filing, answering phones, anything that needed to be done. Again, we loved it. One pivotal day, a very large, not heavy, black man came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder and asked me if I could type. 
When I answered that I was an okay typist, he said, come with me. I told my friends not to leave without me. I was going with James. And this is the way it was back then, in the mid-1960s, in the movement. It was black and white together. Truly, like one of the many verses in We Shall Overcome, we sang this often in the movement, locking arms and swaying way back then. And it remains a warm and wonderful feeling. James carried the typewriter and we walked to the parking lot. We got in a rather old Chevy and five minutes later, James told me that he had just taken Dr. King to the airport in this car. This car? Dr. King was just in this car. What could I do? I patted the seat. We drove farther and farther into the ghetto. James stopped and parked in front of an unattractive ghetto building. He parked the car, got the, tri got the typewriter, and off we went into the building, climbed the stairs. We stopped at the top floor, the third, and James told me as he was unlocking the door that this was Dr. King's rented apartment. 1550 South Hamlin, Dr. King's apartment. And then James, left to go get some things at the drugstore around the corner. He was gone quite a while. No, I didn't mind. I stood in the middle of the living room and thought about it for a while. Dr. King had probably just recently left here. What should I do? I decided on something respectful and meaningful. I sat on the sofa and then in each chair, slightly longer and in the biggest and most comfortable one. This worked. <laughs> then I went into the kitchen and set up the typewriter for our project, still unknown to me. I heard a key unlocking the kitchen door very near me. I recognized Dr. Andrew Young immediately. He sat across from me at the kitchen table and we had an interesting conversation about the movement. He may have been interviewing me, felt like it. James returned and we began and completed his conscientious objector renewal papers due immediately and then into the Chevy again for the ride back to the movement. I had met and shared in depth about our very real hopes and dreams with two of Dr. King's pivotal people, James Orange and Dr. Andrew Young. See their characters in the current movie, Selma, and I had been in Dr. King's car and apartment. I attended the James Meredith March Against Fear in Jackson, Mississippi in June 1966. It was exciting, hot, tiring, especially traveling on a little yellow school bus, another story. And it was the appearance of Stokely Carmichael and the Black Power Movement, perhaps the end for some of us of the black and white togetherness. There was a teacher shortage at this time. Two months after the March Against Fear, I began my 20-year teaching career in a 
a segregated school district, teaching in an all-black school. The only white teacher there by choice. I had a bachelor degree, but no education courses until I took all of the requirements for certification. My master's degree later was in communication science and not elementary education. I was dedicated in teaching the young. Kindergarten was a fine fit. Not just teaching the required concept curriculum, but introducing, working on, and reinforcing, with the help of our magic circles, self-awareness, consciousness, and yes, problem solving. Sometimes it seemed that I could see these young minds opening to themselves, to others, to life, already living the dream. Today I met a boy named Freedom, Freedom He stood up tall and he looked me in the eye Down in the Albany, Georgia jailhouse He said I'm nine years old and I'm ready to die What are you ready? Why did they arrest you and bring you to the jail? He said I was walking down the street Loudly calling and singing my name Don't shout When the world is falling When the world is falling Today I met a beautiful woman named Rosa She stood up tall and she touched the sky Down in Montgomery, Alabama Kept her ground so she could testify What are you keeping your seat for, Rosa? Why did you decide that today was your time? She said I was tired of going in through the back door And if they want to they can go ahead and call it a crime
We live in a time of unparalleled personal freedom and individual power of voice. Worse than it being suppressed is taking it for granted. We must always support and defend the voice of the people, even when its opinion steadfastly opposes our own. There's evolution, pollution in the Constitution, healthcare, welfare, and warfare, indiscretion, confession, and witness protection, government spying and racial profiling, greed, and hypocrisy. And that brings us to the factories and the warehouses, the truck stops and the coffee shops of those that made, made in the USA. We interrupt this poem for a special announcement. Your manufacturing jobs have all been shipped overseas. We apologize for any inconvenience and want you to know it's nothing personal. <laughs> nothing personal. Flash forward to the censorship games. White out, leave out, black out. Gag order, reorder, disorder. Pixelization, politification, and propaganda. When all else fails, silence. When democracy is put to the test, Americans rise to the occasion for they know the unscrupulous will always capitalize on the weakness of others. It's the word you've heard a thousand times before from the Oval Office to the Senate floor, the supreme law of the land you can hold in your hand to take a stand without reprimand. Freedom is quite possibly the most powerful word in the world. And we carry that freedom so boldly on our American shoulders that it makes the stars and stripes a constant reminder to support and defend that freedom for those fortunate enough to have it, those who died in its honor, and those domestic and foreign whose dreams have yet to be realized, that we never ever forget them and what it truly means to be an American with freedom. Thank you. So I'm learning Hebrew. I'm not sure why. I mean, I'm Jewish, but I'm not Jewish Jewish. <laughs> as going to temple every weekend. And there's all these other things I should be doing. But, but there I am every night, holed up under the covers, trying to decipher a, a mem from a samad and a dal from a resh. Because I have this theory. We can't see the civilization that we live in. But we're all part of it. And, and I envision civilization as this big blanket above us. And we're all holding up some small corner of it, like, like doctors and lawyers and, and nurses and judges. But then I had this thought. What if something terrible happens, and, and I'm the only Jewish person left in the world? And then everybody's going to come to me and ask me, what do these prayers mean? For example, there's this prayer. It's sung every Friday night near the beginning of the service. It says, Boeve Shalom, come in peace, crown of her husband. And on the last verse, everyone turns towards the door at the rear of the synagogue to welcome the Sabbath bride. Now, when I first tried to do this, it was really hard to coordinate my mouth with my feet, all the while trying to make the strange alphabet make sense. And, <laughs> but then I learned something. In 1943, the, the French militia, the, the police of the Vichy government, decided to put an end to Jewish worship in Lyon, France. And one Friday night, a Malise commando, armed with three hand grenades, entered the rear door of the great synagogue. Little did he know where they were in the service. Boi Vishalom. The congregation stood up as one to face him. Come in peace. The commando, smug in his snazzy uniform and tight blue beret, was stunned. How did they know he was standing there? He had used all the stealth techniques he had learned from the Nazis. Sweat began seeping into his brown shirt like, like buckets of blood. Besides, he wasn't a killer. He had a new wife, and he had done this dozens of times, tossing hand grenades at nameless hordes of pigs, like, like pitching pineapples at, at monkeys. But this was different. He was staring into the faces of his victims, old grandfathers with their shuffles. Stooped grandmothers worrying about their sons. Some people were smiling iridescent like spruce trees. Others had their heads bent, worried by, by the weight of their lives. But on all their lips was the same thought to welcome the Sabbath, God's beautiful bride, his Shekinah, after six days of hard toil to create a world and hold together their families. 
The Sabbath was a moment of, of menachot, a mystical moment when one could just be and not do. They had no candles, no, no challah, no wine stem glasses, but they could remember being slaves in Egypt. And by resting, they were saying, we are free. Come in peace. Boi vishalom ateret bala gamba simcha uvitala tohe mune am segula boi hala boi hala. He stared. They stared. And then he ran away, <laughs> and they all lived for yet another day. Tohe mune am segula boi hala boi hala. So I'm learning Hebrew. <laughs> I figure this 5,000-year-old blanket was given to me for a reason. So I'm going to spend another day learning another prayer. You can never tell when it might be useful. Thank you. <laughs>